Welcome to the Bioinformatics CRO podcast. I'm Grant Belgard, and joining me today is Matthew Holt. Matthew is a professor at the KU Leuven in Belgium in the Department of Neuroscience and a big fan of the Liverpool Football Club. Welcome, Matthew. Hi, Grant. How are you doing? Doing well. It's, it's good to have you on. Good to be here. So can you tell us about what you do? Yeah. So I'm, as you quite rightly said, a neuroscientist. But unlike the vast majority of neuroscientists who work on neurons in the brain, we're very interested in the, the non-neuronal cell types, in particularly the astrocytes. And we're very interested in these cells because they're the main support cells for neurons in the brain. They influence how they work. And during disease, they go wrong. And it seems increasingly likely that it's alterations in these glial cells that actually initiate disease. So what we want to understand is the basic biology of these cells so we can try and correct them when they go wrong and hopefully keep people's neurons alive in diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. What have been some of the biggest discoveries in the glial biology space during your career? The big initial discovery for me was the discovery that astrocytes can actually sense activity in local neurons, but then can actually respond to it and respond to it by releasing neuroactive substances, which modulate neurotransmission. And then I think just recently, a very, very interesting finding was the fact that astrocytes are responsible for the elimination of neurons, both during development and also in the adult, which rather implies that, you know, they could also basically eat neurons during neurodegenerative disease. And I think that that's a, a, a huge finding which will alter the way people look at this type of, of condition. How has the field responded to these discoveries? Are the neuron-centric people still uh, as strongly neuron-centric as they once were, or, or has the field as a whole been moving in this direction? You know, I think there's an increasing realization amongst neuroscientists that glia in general, so microglia and oligo dendrocytes are essential. I think one of the, the big issues, of course, though, is, you know, people are drawn to fields where they can actually do experiments. And I think part of the problem with the, uh, the glia field for years has actually been the lack of tools, you know. And whenever you write a grant to work on glia, it can seem like it's 20 years behind where people are working on neurons. And I, I think that that is a very, very difficult mindset to overcome. Having said that, I think, you know, with the, uh, the type of technologies we've got now from single cell sequencing, viral vectors, genetically encoded calcium sensors, CA and P sensors, so on and so forth, it's becoming much more easier to do those experiments. And I think as you see that, of course, it's going to draw more people in. So as our listeners can probably infer from your accent, you're not Flemish. Uh, can you tell us a bit about what it's like to work as a scientist in a foreign system? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. I mean, I think there's are, there are advantages and, and disadvantages, of course. I think one of the advantages is personal growth. You get different perspectives on science, of course, different experiences of how organizations are run. And you can sort of cherry pick the styles that uh, suit you best. Of course, there are also disadvantages I think being a foreign scientist coming into any system, you need to understand that system. And I think the higher up you go, the more important that becomes, especially I think actually now that the tendency is for large, if you like, consortium grants. You know, you need to have you know, a pre-existing network. You need to have established people who value your work can vouch for you in a way and are willing to promote you. And of course, that all takes time to develop. And I think one of the problems for 
early career stage scientists is very much, you know, that you have this five year period where you are supposed to be hyper productive. You're supposed to pull in grants, publish, so on and so forth. And if you're having to fight your way into a system, it just makes things much harder. For me, I think I was quite lucky because I moved to Flanders with a very large European Research Council grant, which was one and a half million. So, you know, for five years, I could run quite a nice little group on that while we were finding our feet. But if you don't have that type of resource, I can imagine it's very, very difficult. Other, other than getting a large grant, what steps can early career scientists take to mitigate that? I think the obvious one, of course, that I would say is network. Network as much as possible, as early as possible. I mean, in general, I think most people usually end up going back to their country of, of origin because that's where they have their, the biggest network available. But that's the first thing I would say is get a very strong network. I would also say to most people looking at a postdoc, actually, that it's very, very tempting to go to a big lab with lots of money, you know, with star power almost, and assume it's all about the science. But I think what you really, really want is a very good personal dynamic with your PI as well. You want someone who's going to pick up the phone in three or four years' time and tell their friends, I have a really good postdoc. You should be picking this person up. And I've known one or two examples of that, actually, in my career. Ervin Nayer, one of the Max Planck directors, was, was fantastically supportive of all his staff. And I think at one time there wasn't a postdoc, a German postdoc who had been through the department that wasn't a professor. Because Ervin really went the extra mile for his people. And, and, you know, let's face it, nowadays, there are lots of people with very good papers. It's very attractive to assume it's a metrics game, but I really do think personal connections count for an awful lot. And I would actually even go so far as to say, if you don't think that you're going to get that level of support or develop that personal connection, you might want to get out as quickly as possible and find yourself a lab where, you know, you will have that support if your ultimate goal is to stay in academia. Do you think that's also true at the level of where you do your, your PhD? That really becomes a lot more important with where you do your postdoc or, or is PhD lab also critical in that respect, right? Because there's often this decision people make, you know, do I work with the young PI who can give me a lot more attention and who I'll probably get, you know, more mentoring from, or the very senior PI who's always on the road, but very well connected and, and well resourced. You know, I would say that I think it's probably a bit more important at the postdoc level, or at least when I was doing my PhD, uh, the people that I interviewed with so long as you're coming from a good institute, they were much more interested in trainable potential at that time than papers on the board. Now, of course, whether that's altered slightly now is open to debate. I mean, I certainly know that for the students coming through our institute now, it's a much, much more competitive world. I have to say that I, of course, think that the example of the LMB, the Lab of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, is awesome. I mean, there's a reason why it's produced so many Nobel laureates. And I think that this idea of small dynamic groups where, you know, students have a lot of attention, are free to discuss with senior lab members, but also are given, you know, scope to try their own thing. You know, even when the PI is 90% sure it will fail. I think it's a wonderful model, right? And it's, it's a very, very hard balance to get, of course. But in terms of young career development, I think it's, it is a fantastic model. For me personally, I think if I had been put in a lab of 50 people and I had been, you know, given a desk and told, sort it out, then I would have struggled. So I think it's also person dependent to some degree. And let, let's talk a bit about that because you had 
pretty unusual path into science, uh, starting in, in law and so on. Can you maybe take us back, uh, way back to what attracted you to law in the first place? And then why did you end up going into science? Why law? I think probably because the background that I came from, there was always an assumption that if you went on to university, it was to end up, if you like, with a professional career. So you would be a medic, you would be a dentist, you would be a lawyer. And I think there were two things that drove me towards law. The first one was that my elder brother had already got into medical school and had spent, you know, maybe the best part of of 11 years constantly being compared to my brother. So, you know, going into to law seemed not a bad idea. Then the other thing that, that sort of appealed to me was like the almost romantic notion of defending the, the innocent party against the odds with these courtroom flourishes of oratory, maybe. But I actually realized quite quickly that at least in the, the UK legal system, it's all based on precedent. And if you actually have a science background, which is what I had all the way through school, it's very, very difficult to accept that nowadays you should be bound by a ruling made 250 years ago. Because up till recently, it was actually a, a, a central pillar of British law that basically, uh, if I remember correctly, that judgments made in the House of Lords were, were absolutely binding from the time they were made onwards. And I found that whole concept actually quite absurd, you know, with, with the way societies change, things that were regarded as perfectly acceptable for, you know, my parents' generation or grandparents, and, you know, you, you will know it as well. And, and now, you know, people would be appalled. That was it. I, you know, I, I found it very, very hard to accept that. I also found the work incredibly dull, if you like, I think, because, of course, it's very, very book and library based. And I'd been used to being quite active in practical classes and, you know, take a chunk of sodium and throw it in a pond and, and watch the explosion type of experiments in chemistry. So I was actually quite frustrated. And then... One of the uh, the core legal courses that, that you have to take in the UK is actually, uh, at most universities, is property law. And we had a, a lecture on intellectual property. It was a case about an American university who had taken a tumor from a patient. And this tumor produced large amounts of GMCSF, which at the time was being touted as a, a therapy for HIV. And the question was, who actually would benefit from that? Would it be the patient or would it be the university who basically made the product? And it was quite funny, actually, because I was the only one in the class who actually had any idea, you know, what GMCSF was or what immortalized cells were. And as I was going out of the, uh, the tutorial, the lecturer actually said to me, you know, if you have sort of a science background, you should seriously consider going back because, you know, over the next 10 years, patent law will explode and it will be scientists who who drive this. It's incredible how impactful those little comments can be. Massively, massively. So I I, I applied to go back and, and, and do biochemistry and that's why I ended up in Liverpool, hence the football connection. And the first two years were a, a really standard, you know, university experience. And in the third year, I actually did an industrial placement with Eli Lilly, who at the time were arguably the world's biggest pharma company in the neuroscience space. You know, they had Prozac on the market at the time. I was lucky enough to be there when they released Olanzapine, which was a, a huge hit for them as well. And this was really my first proper lab experience. I really enjoyed it. I got on fantastically well with the guy who was head of research at that time. He'd come in from Bristol. He was a guy called David Lodge, who'd worked on excitatory amino acids. 
And David was just the most wonderful guy. And he used to take me to meetings, quite high level meetings at Eli Lilly, actually. You know, and then he would take me off to meet collaborators at universities. You know, towards the end of my time at Lilly, it was actually David who said to me, I think you should do a PhD. Get back to me if you want to do it type. And the funny thing was, of course, was, you know, sort of arrogance of youth. It was almost, you know, like, oh, I'll find my own place to do PhD. And I applied to the LMB because I really wanted to go to the birthplace of DNA. I went for interview with with the guy that I eventually worked for. And the first thing he said to me was, I see, you know, David Lodge. He was my supervisor as an undergraduate, (laughs) which was my first first experience of how small science actually is. And, you know, I had a great time as a PhD student. The LMB is a fantastic institution. There's no doubt about that. I think at the time I probably had the best of it because there were still five Nobel laureates there. And it was fantastic. You know, you could have coffee with these people, get to call them by their first names, right? And they would know who you are and what you were doing. It was it was a fantastic environment. And then, of course, the question was, what do you do after you finish your PhD? Do you really want to put a suit on and go back to work in a bank or a law firm? At the time, I was actually renting a room from a family in Cambridge. One of the member of the couple, he was a senior academic at the university, and his his wife was always telling me, "Go and work for a bank, you know, go and work for a bank, or go back to law." And I remember one night he just pulled me in the room and he actually said, "Look, Matthew, you know, just look at you. You're just never going to do anything but science." <laughs> I can't actually imagine you wearing a suit type of thing. So I think that was it. And then that's what got me on the, the, the postdoc train. But coming back to what you said, actually, about, you know, just odd conversations or moments really having a profound influence. When I was finishing my PhD, I actually had offers from Shelley Halpain at the Scripps in San Diego. You could have lived on a sailboat. Ah, yeah, maybe. And I also had a offer from Harvard Med. And we actually went over, my supervisor and I, to Ervin Nayer's 60th birthday party that was being held at the Max Planck in his honor. And uh, I just asked Ervin, you know, can I go in and look around your lab, please? Because, you know, I'm on the job market and it might be nice. And I got in the lift and... All the Max Planck directors have the, you know, have a floor to themselves usually. And, and you know, their name is on the, the, the lift button. That's very German. It, well, you know, organization is everything, right? And I looked there and I actually saw the name R. Yarn. And I'd seen Reinhard give a talk a year before at a FENS meeting. And it was a superb talk. And he'd just been recruited back from Yale at the time. And, you know, I didn't know this. And, you know, then you end up with a one building with Reinhard Jahn, Herbert Yeckler, who's a fabulous developmental scientist, and Ervin Nea. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And that was it. I wasn't going to go to the US for a postdoc after that. And again, it's just one of those like really odd moments. You walk into a lift and, and that's it, right? It just changes the future in a way. You've, of course been in Belgium for several years now, but you spent a number of years in in Germany. Can you talk about what your culture shock was like in in both places? What maybe didn't surprise you and and what surprises you found? The biggest shock was the expense of Belgium compared to Germany, I have to say. Belgium is, or at least where I'm now based in Leuven, is very expensive compared to uh, to Göttingen, where I was based before. Although I should qualify this, if you have to live in Munich, you probably need to own a bank. Okay, I mean, Munich's very expensive. But the first thing was the, the expense, and I think generally Belgium's much more expensive. But I have to say, in general, I think that, you know, moving from the UK to Germany, from Germany to Belgium... There's not huge changes. I think, you know, European culture is quite standard almost. 
maybe I think actually your culture shock when you move from the US to Oxford would have been quite larger, right? I think that there is this fallacy that because we speak a common language with the US, somehow the cultures and the expectations are, are quite close. What's the expression of people divided by a common language? I think so, yeah, definitely. I think people forget, actually, the reason we ended up with a United Kingdom was because we wanted a Protestant monarch from Hanover rather than a Catholic monarch from Scotland. In terms of culture shock, I, I there, there wasn't so much. I do miss German bread, I have to say, and I miss German beer, you know, but luckily... Luckily, the European train network is fantastic and you can zoom around quite easily. So, Well, that, that that's a big thing to say for someone currently living in Belgium, right? It's not like you're uh, drinking Bud Light. Well, sure, sure. I, I don't know. Maybe it's the, the, you know, the, the orderly nature of Germany, the fact that they have laws which govern everything. So you basically know what's in the beer. Whereas in Belgium, you know, if you go to, say, the the shops in Bruges where all the tourists are, uh, cherry beer. I mean, it it does seem a little bit bizarre, some of the the beers that they come up with, but, yeah. It's good, though. (laughs) Uh, As a (laughs) one-off. So you also have some unusual hobbies. Yeah? Do you want to talk about road races? (laughs) Yeah, I mean... So I was actually brought up in the northwest of the UK and just off the coast is a little piece of rock known as the Isle of Man. And every year they they close the roads on the Isle of Man and they just turn it into one huge racetrack. So it's like 37 miles. You know, it goes through Douglas, Ramsey, goes over the mountain as well. And it's a big thing, actually, if you, you grow up where I am. It's really quite spectacular. First of all, actually, that there are still places that allow this. And also that you actually have people that want to do it. And it's quite hard to explain. But, you know, basically you you have people racing at speeds of 200 miles an hour, so 300 kilometers an hour, basically on normal roads that, you know, on normal days are cars, tractors, buses type thing in close proximity to stone walls, telegraph poles. And actually, you're you're that close, you could probably put your hand out and actually touch them as they go past. And it really is the most spectacular thing to see and to hear. And also the people that that, that tend to to, uh, go really are hardcore motorbike fans. And it has to be said, from a very young age... I have had this this real interest in motorbikes, which I basically think comes from my dad, you know, and we used to spend hours on a on a Saturday afternoon, you know, going around the, the local bike shops and, and so on and so forth. So we basically try and, and, and get to the races where we can. And also Ireland. Ireland, they also run smaller race meets at the weekends during the summer. And that's also great because I love Ireland. I think Ireland's a fantastic place. I think the Irish are really great people, very warm, welcoming, and the Guinness is great as well. And what's this I hear about Olympic boxing trials? Yeah, so it, it's quite bizarre. My mum could never reconcile why a, a neuroscientist would like boxing. You know, people have a odd preconception when you say boxing. I mean, obviously, there's the professional game. The amateurs is just a very, very different sport. But yeah, I do love amateur boxing because I think the guys are phenomenal athletes, to be honest with you. They're great athletes. They're incredibly dedicated. And yeah, this time last year, actually, I I did have tickets to the, the British Olympic boxing trials. And then, of course, COVID hit and they, they closed them down. And then there was talk of them starting them up but the boxers would have to wear masks until they got to the ring and so on and so forth, which I thought was quite ironic given the fact that when they got to the ring, they would spend, you know, nine minutes free to try hitting each other. but Stalking each other in the face uh, and and breathing on each other. (laughs) Yes, of course. You know, the the, the aim of of the sport actually is to, 
Well, the aim of the sport is to amass points, basically, and, and you score points by by you know striking your opponent. For me, actually, I find fighters that can actually slip punches work the ring well. You know, avoid taking punishment, and to do that, actually, for nine minutes at a high level. It's the longest nine minutes you'll probably ever have in your life. It's not easy. They are very, very fit, mentally very, very focused. Like I said, the professional game's different, of course. You know, there's money involved. I think that, you know, people are badly, badly used in the professional game. But for the amateurs, I, 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 yeah, I do like it very much. You can say what you want, but, you know, American football, you know, whoever had the idea of using basically the head as a weapon, you know, I'm I'm not sure there's a lot of difference. Yeah, fair enough. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, when you're talking about the skills of boxers, my mind, for some deranged reason, went to science. So uh, what, what do you think are kind of the, the scientific equivalents uh, of that? You know, what, what makes you a good scientific ring fighter? There's a certain level of dedication. You, you have to love doing what you're doing. I think there's a certain amount of accepting pain, whether that's physical or you know, in the purely physical sense of, or just, you know, the sheer mind-numbing pain of things not working. I think both are quite solitary events, you know. I mean, basically, your performance is dependent on yourself. And I think there's an awful lot of focus needed and to get to the top in either. I think you you need good skills, right? And those come through hours and hours of, of practice and repetition, you know. I remember talking to you about this, this is it this so-called 10,000 hours of, of practice, there's a reason why people get good at Western blotting, right? And that's just because they make a lot of gels and they, they do a lot of blots. And, you know, I, I think it's sometimes really easy for people to overlook this because they regard it as, you know, it's a job or I'm at school. But, you know, really all those hours in the classroom and, you know, doing experiments, it's it's all part of the, the 10,000 hours at least in my view, if you like. Following a bit on that, because I, I don't know if you know this would be a contender, but what are the biggest misconceptions you see among young scientists these days? And, and what are the biggest mistakes you think early career scientists make? You know, I think we all have this view of the heroic scientist who's on their own working all hours, day after day after day, trying to work through a problem. I think there are very, very few places in the world now, unfortunately, where you are able to do that within the academic system. So, you know, I'm thinking of places like the LMB, maybe Janelia Farm, but for most scientists, you are in a grant-based system and you are judged by productivity. And I think one of the things that people need to keep in mind is actually knowing when to give up. This again was a you know a conversation I re- actually remember having it at the sink with a colleague of mine when we were at the Max Planck. You know, and I had come from the LMB. I was at the Max Planck. There was no problems with money. There really wasn't pressure to publish and. My colleague, who's a very good friend, he'd come from a a normal university environment. He actually said to me, this is not normal. Out in the real world, you are going to be asked at the end of three to five years, what have you got? And I think there's a very, very fine line between persevering and giving something a really good shot, but also knowing basically when you, you just have to drop it or at least put it to one side for the time being, because at the end of the day, you know, you have to leave your PhD, you have to leave your postdoc with papers on the board. You know, Now, of course, you can argue whether that actually is a good use of public money. Maybe you could argue that 
public money would be better spent by letting people go away, have ideas, giving them funding for 10 or 15 years. But, you know, that's not the system that we're in. To a certain degree, you have to play within the system you're in, of course. And I think that for most people, it's a fine line between pushing something that could give you your nature neuroscience, your science paper, your your nature paper, or basically just putting your career into a grave after five years. Well, what what changes would you make to the current system if, if you know, Matthew Holt became the, uh, the dictator of public science funding? What would we see? One of the big things that carries a lot of weight on grant committees tends to be track record. And this may be a little bit contentious to say because I can see it from both sides, right? You could argue that the best predictor of future performance is past performance, right? I mean, you you can argue that. And and to a degree, you know, there is some truth. People who've published in the past are probably going to publish well in the future. But at the end of the day, a, a good idea is a good idea. I can never remember the name of the guy, but the guy that won the Nobel from the, for the Higgs boson. Higgs. Well, yeah, Higgs, but I can't remember his first. Peter or something. Yeah. I think it was Peter, yeah. But, uh, but you know, he had, a, he had like seven papers over, you know, quite a large period of time. And he openly admits that he would never have survived in the, the current academic climate, right? But all of those papers are from from what I understand, right? Because of, you know this is is physics that's well above my level are hugely influential. So if I, I had control of a of a large budget, I think I would be far more likely to give uh, money for ideas without necessarily you know a, a person with a, a huge track record. I think in a way also as well, this is is why established large groups suck up a lot of grant money and why it's difficult for for young group leaders to get on the ladder, you know, because funding agencies want to see something for their money. And I also think as well that track record sort of feeds into this feeling that I can't have a gap in my CV, you know. So you go from doing a PhD on... I don't know, LTP, and you do LTP as a postdoc, but it's slightly different. And then you do it as a PI. But if you actually look at you know where big advances come, they usually come at the interface of subjects with, with people who have really broad expertise and can appreciate different techniques. I think a fantastic example was Rod McKinnon, right, who started life as a channel physiologist and you know, use the tools that he came to know about during physiology, actually, to, to check that the, the channels he was purifying were, were still functional, you know, and he was also smart enough to, to realize that bacterial channels were easier to purify and then to crystallize. But, you know, this was someone who really, well, cross fertilized their research right across disciplines. I think that you want people like this. I think it was Seymour Benzer that actually said young people should be given a number of passes to do what they want, you know, when they're a bit younger. And, you know, then when you run out of passes, of course, you've got to decide what you want to do. But my concern is, is that people are being constrained far too early because of, you know, the comparative lack of funding, but also the number of people in the system as well. Maybe one day we'll all have our own NFTs and uh, <laughs> go back to a, a renaissance model of science funding. Uh, so for, for our closing question, on what important question do you disagree most with your colleagues? Actually, I'd probably have to say the thing that I disagree most on is with, with my colleague Bassam Hassan about whether Liverpool or Bayern Munich are the better team. Important questions. <laughs> well, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, coming on. Well, thanks for having me, Grant.